they do not want to eat, they do not want to go to school, and basically you caught with a situation where your child did have a real illness. Here again, this was another presentation of anemia in a child with itself. So also can the distal end, this is a sac that needs to be emptied. Now you have the formation of an ulcer, it causes pyloric stenosis, which is narrowing of the outlet of the, of the, of the stomach itself. Cancer can also form in the distal end of the stomach, and basically that can also cause narrowing. But in addition to that, the other causes of, let's say, gastritis or cancer formation in the stomach itself can present with insidious onset of bleeding. And that bleeding produces um, um, melina stools, which are dark, blackish stool, sometimes with a high um, foul-smelling odor to it. But that's the kind, same kind of stool you will get with if you take iron tablets as well. So the confusion actually created by that insidious onset and loss of blood from the stomach, whether it be from an, in, from an infective process to a cancerous process that caused blood to ooze throughout the small intestine and then coming out through the large, through the large intestine, out to the rectum, is not bright red blood, but it's evidence of dark, um, dark greenish black stool, which is melina. Those are some of the causes that we find within the stomach. Within the small intestine that can produce anemia are things like chronic inflammatory disease. Cancers are very uncommon in the small intestine, but inflammatory diseases like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis colitis can all present with insidious loss of blood from inside it, from the inflammation that can produce anemia. We all know the different ways in which cancer can present in the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon. We'll try and describe that in our next discussion, how cancers in the different parts of the in, of the of the large bowel presents itself quite differently. But just to show you that anemia or low blood count presenting in an elderly patient can be due to any number of factors starting from the mouth through to the esophagus down to the stomach. But also in addition to that, that is just from the increased decreased food intake because of these, these uh, increased decreased food intake and increased blood loss. But other factors to anemia for that elderly person is the bone marrow. Is it producing the red blood cells? Is there any other process within the, the bone marrow that is causing us to lose the blood or not produce among the blood? Because either we have the bone marrow is sleeping on itself and not producing, or there's a competing process from white blood cells taking over the function of the base of the red blood cells. Is it also an evidence of a hepatosplenomegaly in which the red blood cells are being destroyed much faster? So there are lots of conditions that can present with the elderly to cause anemia and present with very, very common symptoms that we usually have, that increasing tiredness, fatigue, inability to do this stuff. But you also have the coexisting conditions of congestive heart failure, things to do with abnormal heart rate and rhythm in the elderly, endocrine causes, respiratory causes, that also present with the increasing tiredness and fatigue. That in itself is trying to, to analyze what goes on in the elderly in a nutshell, but as a diagnostic process, it does take time. It does take the care and interest of a physician to make sure. So when your parents present with anemia, or you present with anemia, or the symptoms of anemia, do not take it lightly. Make sure a full evaluation is done, and let us at least get the blood count to where it's supposed to be. Do, supposed to be. But in addition to that, is make sure we find out what is the underlying cause of the anemia, and being able to treat that. And if there is a treatable cause, let's at least correct it. If there's not a treatable cause, let us at least find out what the diagnosis is and at least have the best possible life that we possibly can have towards the end of our lives. We'll continue our discussion on anemia in the elderly. And... Uh, just a global perspective on how anemia in the elderly presents in terms of, let's say, the gastrointestinal tract, from decreased food intake from the mouth, increased absorption in the stomach, decreased passages of food as it goes through the gastrointestinal from the mouth itself to the esophagus, into the stomach, and either from blood loss within the stomach or the fact of not being able to take enough food via the mouth, said, whether due to a cerebral cause, whether due to a local cause, whether it be from depression, etc., whether it be from mechanical obstruction to the outlet, to the inlet of food through either the proximal end of the esophagus to the fact that the esophagus itself to coming into the stomach itself, where either they be 
an inflammatory process, a neoplastic process that prevents all of this. And let's focus a little bit more to do what happens in the large intestine and the small intestine. Remember also that anemia can also be as a result of bone marrow problems. In fact, if the, if the bone marrow does not produce enough red blood cells, either because intrinsically not having the material, whether it be the iron or the protein to produce the red blood cells, or there's a competing mechanism where the bone marrow, let's say the white blood cell or the platelets, has replaced or pushed the red blood cell aside, that can also be a cause for anemia because one is now competing for the other. Also, in addition to that, if you have an abnormal hemoglobin, which causes an increased blood loss because the red blood cells do not remain alive for such a period of time. Also, you have a condition in which hepatosplenomegaly, for whatever cause, if it's for myelosclerosis or other causes that are much more common, a leukemia, lymphoma, etc., can cause the blood to pool within the liver and the spleen itself and hence cause an anemia due to a pooling effect because that blood is no longer in the intravascular compartment. It is now pooling within the liver and the spleen. Those are all causes of anemia. But let's put those aside and let's say all of those in our particular elderly patient came back as normal. In the case of my father, eight year, eight, nine years ago, who presented with anemia and jaundice from a catabolic process, prior to his demise, those are some of the cases we face within our own families. But let's say we've ruled out all the other causes and we face with two particular causes in an elderly patient who presents with anemia and we narrow it down that says that we're still in the investigative, in, in investigative process of trying to find out what it is and we face with let's try and see what's going on in the small intestine and the large intestine per se. Within the small intestine because cancers are so uncommon in that area, but the most common cause is inflammatory processes. Much more common in a younger individual with Crohn's disease, which is a chronic inflammatory bowel disease, and ulcerative colitis itself, or diverticulitis, which forms within diverticulum, outpocketing from the large intestine that sometimes occur. And let's say we've actually ruled out a neoplastic process that occurs within the small intestine. That leaves us now with a large intestine from the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and then the sigmoid and the rectum. A cancer that produces, so this is a small bowel with the mental fat. We're looking beyond and behind this for the cause of our anemia in our elderly patients. Let's say, for instance, now this is your appendix would produce with all of these symptoms that we sometimes complain about with the right, of, right lower quadrant pain, etc. But nothing to do with anemia per se, but just a disgusting process in terms of diagnosis in the young adult presenting with right lower quadrant pain. Let's look at that, that you have the junction between the small intestine and the large intestine, the alucecal valve, which can undergo a lot of um, carcinoid processes that produce endocrine problems. But we face now with ascending colon. Just imagine this is your ascending colon with a cecum, which can enlarge to twice the size it normally is and can actually accommodate a tumor much larger than this to the point of presenting with an anemia without any other symptoms because the cecum itself can enlarge to be as much as this. I've actually seen a tumor, a cancer within the cecum, a cecal cancer that only presented in this patient with anemia because there was no evidence of obstruction to the flow. Just imagine the two differences. If in the cecum itself you can reach twice the size of it and actually being the size as large as this to a, a point in which anything to do with the rectum with a small cancer can produce alterations in bowel habits but also in addition that can cause pencil-like stool which can present as an earlier diagnosis. In this particular patient who presented with a large cecal mass to cause a profound anemia, the tube had grown to such a size that it actually spread to involve the mental area, the mental fat itself, and actually spread to metastasize to the liver in this patient that presents with it. So to such a profound anemia as a result of blood loss, presenting very late because the cecum itself can enlarge to such a capacity. Usually in the ascending colon, a cancer in the ascending colon does not, um, does not present with many florid symptoms except anemia, the tiredness and the fatigue from the catabolic process by the decrease in blood loss and also from the simple fact of having something that's, that's actually nourishing off your entire um, 
body so you have less much less energy to expend you also feel the effects of having a cancer which is also um, in itself produces on the brain itself um, a, um, a mild form of depression itself in the transverse colon itself very few symptoms more or less you can have um, the formation of a cancer itself but there again it's not much different from the sequel process it presents but it obviously is not just as common as it occurs here the descending colon which can, which can have a lot of pathology involving cancer formation, polyformation, etc. We can have symptoms of alteration in bowel habits, especially something that causes an obstruction or the alteration in bowel habits and not being able to pass stool. When a cancer presents here and it bleeds, you obviously will present with bright red blood because of the proximity of the descending colon to the rectum. If, however, cancer in the stomach presents itself acted upon by the gastrointestinal juice, especially hydrochloric acid, it will alter it to present as not bright red blood through the rectum, but alteration like melina stool. So there is a big difference with bleeding that occurs in the stomach, whether it be from a cancer or an ulcer. It presents with, a, with greenish black stool, blood that occurs or bleeding that occurs in the distal colon, the sigmoid colon, and the rectum itself is bright red blood. Cancers occur much, much more commonly in the rectosigmoid junction and the distal end of the colon. The nice thing about that, or the good thing about that, is passing a colonoscope or passing a sigmoidoscope, you can actually diagnose this. Obviously, the gold standard is not to just take the rectum and the sigmoid colon, but to pass it all the way through the transverse colon down to the ascending colon for evidence of cancer or polyps. Polyps are just these outpocketings that occur here that sometimes the majority of them sometimes can be benign which means non-cancerous to the point of being cancerous having found them obviously you need to send them to the lab and biopsy them the treatment of choice obviously in a cancer depends on where it presents itself and basically um, how advanced it is in the case of our patient with a cecal cancer that had spread to the mental fat and actually spread to the to the liver itself now that I made it a stage four, there's really nothing you can do about that. Just palliative treatment, relieve the obstruction, whether it be by an, um, a colonoscopy, um, colon, um, um, ileostomy or a colostomy, or a removal of portion of the, of the colon itself, the disease portion, portion, and all you're doing it is dealing with, five, with, with, with survival for a year, two years as, as it is. In a case, you want to be able to diagnose these things before they reach the stage um, of metastasis or spreading to the to the lymph nodes itself. So the anemia as a presenting complaint with an elderly patient and we're narrowing down to the descending to the colon area and the ileum itself, the small intestine. Obviously here again you want to at least diagnose it before it's too advanced but always use the index of suspicion of anemia, the tiredness, the fatigue that the patient presents with, and try and at least be able to figure out what is going on before. If haven't done a colonoscopy and it comes back as being negative, obviously there's a three to five year before you repeat it, unless the patient has a strong family history of colonic cancer or gastrointestinal cancer. Here again, it's not really the diagnosis that's so important to the patient, but have the education to be able to to, to understand that when you present with anemia, think about the possibility of the stuff that can actually cause it. So when you, read, when you talk to your physician, you're able to even diagnose for yourself that I think this could possibly be as a result of this. The reason being I'm passing dark stool, I'm having alteration of bowel habits, I'm having anorexia, I don't feel like eating, tiredness and fatigue. So I think, doctor, I, I'm not telling you what you should be doing, but I think we need to at least make sure I do not, I'm of the age group. My father had colonic cancer. I think I should have a colonoscopy done. I think you should have a blood test done for me to see whether or not because I have a family history of bone marrow cancer. I think also in addition to that, I'm not even digesting my food. I know I have diabetes, but at least at the same time, is there anything else that's going on within my stomach? Is my anemia result because of my poor dietary habits or is it because of my increased blood loss? Is my anemia as a result of the fact that I am my bone marrow because my mother had um, leukemia? Is it because of a leukemic process or a bone marrow infiltrative process or a disease process that's affecting it? Is it because of my hepatosplenomegaly? Could this also be a presenting complaint because my uncle died of pancreatic cancer? And these are the things that you engage your physician in, so at least he or she is aware that you know of some of the things that run in your family 
that are unique to you as a patient and you're able to instruct your physician as what you think is a possible diagnosis. So you're part of the decision making, not just a recipient of a diagnosis made from an individual who's seeing you for a fraction of the time, five or 10 or 15 minutes and trying to engage with a diagnosis that you are not benefit, you are the sole beneficiary of, but you're not contributing to it. That is all for now of educating your physician that yes you do know something about some of the common illnesses but you also how it becomes relevant to you based on the symptoms you are having and also from your genes and what are the processes that you've actually been able to educate yourself that some things are much more common in some of our families and uh, basically you need to educate your physician that I think I may be suffering from this but can you tell me if this is so so the more education we have the better the outcome we're going to be for the, the symptoms and the signs and symptoms of physicians are going to be able to elucidate from their examination. I hope this has been of a, an assistance to you and hope you can benefit from it as well.